Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Walnut Hills United Methodist Church uh, on this rainy, cold, wintry mix, the uh, Palm Sunday. We're so thankful that you could be with us today, either in person or online, um, and we're going to get started with a little music. Come with me into the journey, come and see where I abide. Come, for I am there among you, come, my arms are open wide. Come and feel the wind that's blowing, come and taste the bread and wine, come and go action come and live this way of mine come and serve the poor and hungry come and hear our neighbors cries come and stand with me for justice come and see the dead will rise come and help me turn the tables come speak truth to all we meet come the feast of life is ready come and i will wash your feet Come stand by as friends forsake me, come where I am laid in earth. Come, but do not fear the shadows, come, for I will bring new birth. Come and promise day is dawning, come and see and come and dare, dare to trust that I am to trust that I am there. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at Walnut Hills. My name is Nate Nims. I'm the pastor here. Thanks for coming out. For everybody that's with us online, it's good to see you. For the folks that are on the side, I can see most of you. Um, so we've got some uh, temporary speakers up. This last week, we uh, had a bunch of new audio equipment installed, and our speakers that are coming are in Germany. So they'll be here in July, and until then, we've got these ones up. But I want to say thank you to... Julie and Brandon and Lonnie and Steve and Mark and Betty and Daryl and Peggy and Matt and the whole crew of folks that were here during the week to make the install possible. So thank you all very much for that. I also want to uh, celebrate and thank uh, the Varley family and Carl for this uh, memorial in Evelyn's name as we uh, celebrate and remember her. This was also a, uh, a very heavy volunteer week around the church in some other ways. Uh, we had the middle schoolers and high schoolers pack Easter eggs on Wednesday night, and uh, they were packing up all the eggs, and at one point, Harrison said to me, I deserve a pay raise. Um, <laughs> I told them, like, they were eating candy all the time, and I thought that was enough, but Harrison said he needed $100 an hour, so <laughs> it's going on my tab. Anyway, thanks to the middle schoolers and high school kids for doing that. And then yesterday, we had a whole crew of folks in elements somewhat similar to this, cleaning up around the building and um, avoiding being attacked by the goose that's on the loose. Um, <laughs> Some of you may have been greeted by that too, but we've got a nest here, so watch out for Gus and Gertie, because um, they are around. 
Anyway, thank you for being here at Walnut Hills. We're a place to call home where all are welcomed, nourished spiritually, and sent forth to serve, and it's good to be with you. So as we begin the service, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit, and we'll sing our opening hymn. It's Who Is He? It's in the worship and song book, number 3082, and the words will be up on the screen. And before you take a seat, uh, take a moment to greet the folks that are nearby you. As you find your way back to your spots, we'll invite the kids to come up for the children's song. scale of thumb down to thumb up. How you feeling? Yeah, a lot of thumbs up today. Good. Nice. A little tired? Yeah, me too. But I have coffee for that, so I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Halfway? Yeah. Oh, a little tired? Yeah. Yeah. Well, today is Palm Sunday. Do you know what that means? No. No? So, on Palm Sunday... One of the things that we do is we get these palm branches because there was a time in Jesus' life where he was with his friends on the Mount of Olives, which is just outside the city of Jerusalem, and then they started walking into the city of Jerusalem, and as they did, they started to wave palm branches. So, Allie, we'll give you some. Wesley, we'll give you some. Lucas, oh, you got it? Yep. 
Calvin. So they started to wave these palm branches, celebrating that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And as they were waving the palm branches, they were saying, Hosanna, which means God is with us, or God saves, God redeems, God cares. They were waving these palm branches to remember that Jesus was with them, that God loves them, and so they were going to wave these palm branches and let everybody know that God was with them. So it was like a, like a little parade. Have you ever been in a parade? Yeah. You have been? Yeah? Anybody else been in a parade? No. Yeah? No? Well, you're all going to be in a parade right now, okay? So, we're going to do a little follow the leader, and you have a bunch of palm branches. So, we're going to give them to folks as we walk by. And do you remember what they said when Jesus came into the city? Hosanna. Hosanna. So, we're going to walk around, we're going to say Hosanna, and we're going to give people palm branches. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. Yeah. So wave, wave your palm branches and walk around. And if somebody doesn't have a palm, you can give them one. So wave them. There you go, Dave. Jeff. Yeah. Good job. Good job. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Good work, everybody. Oh. Good work. You got one? Come back. Yeah, you can grab some from the bucket. There you go. Yeah, we got to go to the far side now. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. There you go. Nope. Here you go. You get, all right. Good job. Yeah. All right. Now, you need one still, so we'll give you that one. All right. Yeah. 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 There you go. All right. Good job. All right. Now that we're back from... I know. They shedded a little bit. Um, I have two, and I don't want three. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. See? Now, you still have some? That's all right. Just wave them. Yeah. Oh, yours cracked. Now, look at everybody behind you. Yeah. We're all a part of this big parade now. We're all a part of celebrating that Jesus is with us, that Jesus' love is guiding us, and that we're going to share this with one another. And that's what the hope of Palm Sunday is about, remembering that Jesus has come and that we get to be a part of of this big parade of God's love and grace. So, there'll be a chance for you to wave these again when the choir sings, if you want to. But for now, we'll say a prayer. So please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love and the parade that we join in. Your grace makes us Part of of your work work in the world. world. Amen. Amen. And if you want to grab a piece of candy, there you go. As we uh, come to a time of prayer with one another, if there's a a prayer that you want to share with the church, one way that you can do that, in the back of your seat, there's an orange card and a spot that you can fill out. You can put that in the offering later and uh, share that with the staff or with the prayer email that we send out for folks online. You can add prayers to the comments. And a few prayers that folks ask to be shared this week are from 
Uh, Kathy asking for prayers for her niece, Ellen, who's on a journey through cancer. We had another prayer for Edith, for someone else, a, a little boy in the Storm Lake area she knows named Tony, who's six years old and is going through cancer treatments in the Children's Hospital in Omaha. And uh, Cassandra asked for prayers for her best friend, Kayla, and her family as she's recovering after surgery in Iowa City this week. So we know there are more prayers on our hearts and in our community to lift up. And as we hold those all together, let's join in the responsive prayer that will be up on the screen. God of grace, for so long we have been warned of a divine love that punishes. This teaching has taken hold around us and within us at, grace co at great cost. We shun and shame. We fear accountability. We close off possibilities for transformation. Help us to break this pattern and learn new ways of living and sharing your mercy. There are times when God calls us to come and rest, be at peace. Wisdom meets us like a friend, settling our anxiety and bringing comfort. There are times when God comes to us through chaos and disorder. Love moves like a mighty wind, troubling all efforts to dominate and control. God brings stillness. God stirs up. God is restful and restorative. Let us welcome God, trusting the Spirit through confusion and clarity. Patient God, in your tender love towards us, we are invited again and again to follow the example of Jesus so that we might not only know, but experience and share your grace. Even when we flee, you are with us. So in this week, may we experience the mercy and grace of Jesus through whom we have been given life and resurrection. All this we pray through Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our reading today is from the book of Jonah. We've been looking through this book throughout Lent, and uh, we are at the final few verses of Jonah today. And I just want to, if you've never read the story of Jonah before, you might think the ending is pretty abrupt, because it is. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to read and then sit down. And when I sit down, you might be thinking there has to be more to this story and there's not. So, here is our reading today from Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 to 11. But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city of Nineveh. Then the Lord provided a shrub, a gourd, and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub, but God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked and ate the shrub so that it died. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, it is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, yes, my anger is a good thing, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, you pitied the shrub for which you did not work and you did not raise. It grew in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals?
So we have come to the end of the book of Jonah. And I just got to ask, like, how do you feel? (laughs) Did you think a book of the Bible would end with the rhetorical question, and also many animals? (laughs) It's just sort of an abrupt, odd ending to the story. And there have been all sorts of twists and turns throughout the story of Jonah. And when we started looking at it uh, six weeks ago now, you might have known that Jonah is the story of the guy that gets swallowed by the fish. But now that we've come to the end, and it just sort of makes you wonder, like, did a page get lost somewhere over the centuries? Like, did something go missing? Or, I mean, the ending of Jonah, this is a somewhat dated reference, and I know a lot of people won't get it, but it's kind of like the end of Sopranos, right? Like there is a scene developing, you think something is going to happen, and then the screen just goes blank, and you're just left wondering, like, that's the end? Like, there's got to be more to it. Or if you've ever been to the movie theater, like it comes to the end of the movie, like credits start to roll, and you're thinking, huh, Okay, I I guess I'll stay and watch the credits to see if they end up getting shawarma at the end because that happened in the Avengers. So like you never know if you're going to get one of those post-credit scenes, but the story of Jonah ends and then it's just over. There's nothing but this question that sort of hangs in the air and also many animals, right? So first, we can admit that the story of Jonah, um, it's got a weird ending. It sort of unravels. It doesn't really seem like it comes to a conclusion. And then secondly, this story of Jonah, it kind of builds, but there's no sort of crescendo of God talking about grace or justice or forgiveness or mercy. It just comes to this story about a shrub and a gourd and how Jonah was happy. And one detail of this story is this shrub that grows up, it is the first and only thing that Jonah has ever been happy about in the entire story. Jonah has been a grump until he gets a gourd from the Lord that gives him a little bit of shade. And then everything is perfect, but everything else in the story is miserable And even when Jonah gets that shrub, the next day there's a worm that gets a buffet and it eats it until it withers and dies. And all of a sudden, Jonah is furious. Jonah is in a bad mood. Jonah doesn't have comfort or happiness anymore. So what do we, what do we make of a story like this? What do we, what do we think of the first person that read this story and thought to themselves, you know what? This belongs in the Bible. (laughs) This, this is a story that people need to be talking about 3,000 years later because it tells us something about God. This story unravels, and so we'll try to make sense of it as best we can. And I think it starts to make sense with this verse as it started. But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what happened to the city. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, an empire that conquered the northern part of Israel that was cruel and callous towards their enemies and their own people. The Assyrians were vicious. Jonah goes there and says repent, and then they do. And that makes Jonah mad, so he goes to the edge of the city to watch and see what happens. And I like to imagine that when Jonah gets there, he pulls out his popcorn. He's just like, something's going to happen. I want to take in the show. Like he, he is expecting to see wrath and vengeance and violence. He is expecting to see the city turned upside down. He wants to see those people get what they deserve. Because the Assyrian empires, they were cruel. And if you were here with us last week, you might remember the little bit of Asher and Asher Paul II talking about all of the people that he beheaded and skinned, making it sound like Ed Gein was his interior decorator. 
<laughs> right? Like, it was just awful and violent and gut-wrenching. They were not good people. But I did learn this during the last week. The people of Nineveh, um, if you are ever stuck in a conversation and need to fit in some small talk, little known fact, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, they were not actually in Babylon. They were in Nineveh. So there was some archaeological evidence discovered in 2018 that uh, uncovered an aqueduct, and it was inscribed with a message Senarashib, king of the world, over a great distance, I had water courses directed to the environs of Nineveh. So the hanging gardens were there, and it got to be confused with Babylon because in 689 BC, Nineveh was started to be called New Babylon. So a little fun fact for you. Also fun fact about ancient Nineveh, the Assyrian king Ashurnasherpal, who beheaded and skinned his enemies, uh, he built a library in Nineveh that's estimated to have contained at least 30,000 clay tablets. Included among them was the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the earliest pieces of literature that we have in the world. So as cruel and as callous and as vicious as the people of Nineveh were, they had art, they had culture, they had community, they had lives. But Jonah goes to the edge of town, and maybe, maybe he checked out one of those clay tablets and wants to get in some reading before he goes home. But he gets, he gets to the edge of the city, and he has this thought that we all sometimes think. Thank God that person is going to get what they deserve. Right? Thank God that person's going to get kicked in the shins. Thank God they're going to have something coming. So God, if you want to send a plague or a lightning bolt, that would be great. Because I just want to watch the show. Right? It's, it's at this point in the story, another cultural reference, some of you may not get it, some of you may will. It's at this point in the story that Jonah gets that little gourd plant that makes him happy. And then it withers and dies. And God says to Jonah, you cared so much about this plant. But I care about these 120,000 people that don't seem to know they're left from their right and they were suffering in squalor and hurting themselves and one another and I want to see them thrive. Like, Jonah, there are people dying, right? Care about more than this plant. Care about these people and care about also their many animals, right? Give, give something to them. It's as if... God is saying to Jonah at the end of this book, you care about this plant, but I care about people. You take joy in seeing this shrub flourish, but I want to see people flourish. You love this gourd. I love Nineveh. God is saying to Jonah, I am not the vengeance that you think I am. You want me to be wrath. You want me to be cruel. You want me to be retribution, but that's not what I'm about. The early church leader and saint Arrhenius in the first, in the second century put it like this. The glory of God is a human being fully alive, and to be fully alive consists in beholding God. That a human being is fully alive, that is what brings God joy beholding, seeing and being seen, participating in love and mercy and grace and goodness and peace and hope. That is what it means to be fully alive. So God says to Jonah, I want to see people flourish. I want to see them bloom. I want to see them grow just like you wanted to see that shrub. I care about them so much more. Now I'm guessing six-ish weeks ago when we started talking about the story of Jonah, you knew it was about a guy getting swallowed by a fish, and maybe you thought to yourself, the message of the story of Jonah is, do what God tells you to, or else. Right, like, if you were to t turn the story of Jonah into a very quick Sunday school lesson, which, have you ever thought about how, <laughs> it's like this, kids really love the story of Noah, is a story about global genocide a good children's story? 
Maybe not, <laughs> right? But we turn, it's, it's a story with animals, so let's turn it into a story for kids. And I can remember in my own childhood reading the story of Jonah and thinking to myself, if I don't do good things, a fish is going to get me, <laughs> right? Like, I've got to do everything right or else God is going to do something to me. But what have we seen in this story of Jonah? God is patient. God gives second chances. God cares about the people that we hate. God has mercy even when we don't. There is this continual invitation throughout the book of Jonah to join God in this work of restoration, of reconciliation, of making things right, of saying that God cares about and loves those people too. So perhaps we can think about this odd ending of the story of Jonah As if God is asking us a question in return, are we going to hold out for revenge and retribution or are we going to bless and reconcile and love one another to capture what it's like to follow God with and for one another? So what do you do with your enemy? Or maybe maybe you don't like the term enemy. What do you do with your ex? What do you do with your neighbor that complains about when you bring in and out the trash cans? What do you do about the HOA chairperson that walks the neighborhood with a clipboard to make sure everything's in line? What do you do with the person that, have you ever, have you ever been behind somebody at the grocery store in the 10 items or less line and somebody has 22 cans of soup, but they say, hey, it's one item, get off my back. It is not the time or place about the discussion of are that many individual cans different items and the person wants to say, no, it's all soup. But then you want to say, no, it is split pea, it is chicken noodle, it's tomato, you have multiple stuff, go to the other section. (laughs) What do you do with that person when you want to see the high V security guard, which I'm still getting used to, walk up with their belt and a small part of you thinks to yourself, I'm going to have a front row seat to seeing them get maced. (laughs) Oh, right? We, we all have a little bit of Jonah in us that wants to see them get theirs. Sometimes we want to build a shelter on the edge of town so that we can wait and watch and see them burn too because it is, It's really easy to define our enemies. And we don't always go so far as to say enemies, so even even people that we don't like. It's easy to define one another by our worst qualities. And just thinking of my, my own experiences with folks, there are a lot of times where my need to be right, which means they had to be wrong, soured a lot of relationships where I just didn't give them a chance to see eye to eye. And I can't tell you how many times I have wanted to say to someone, you don't know me, you just know a mistake that I made. But when somebody tries to say that back to me, it's like I can't hear it. I want that forgiveness, I want that mercy, I want to be reconciled, I just, I want it on my terms. I don't always really want the grace that welcomes everybody to the same table with grace and mercy and hospitality. And that is not to say that everything that we do wrong, everything that disrupts, everything that destroys, all of the cruelty and the callousness of the Assyrian Empire and every way that we hurt and harm one another, it has to be reckoned with somehow. But the same moment it comes to us where we remember we're all children of God trying to do our best. And at the end of this story, God sees 120,000 people, a huge amount of people for the ancient world. God sees them withering, and God wants to see them come back to life. God wants to see them thrive, and it's as if we're asked with Jonah Are we going to live for hope or are we going to seek desecration? Are we going to 
live for hope or vengeance? Do we want mercy or do we want judgment? Do we want grace or do we, do we want vengeance? And then we're asked, how far do you think this mercy goes? In the Sermon on the Mount, there's a moment where Jesus says, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. You can't dodge raindrops today. You're going to get them. And the people that you hate are going to get raindrops on them too. Right? This rain, it falls on all of us. And in the ancient world, when people were tied much more closely to their agriculture on a visceral level, where if they didn't get this rain, they couldn't go to the grocery store at 11 o'clock at night to get a tomato, right? Like they, they were connected intimately to this pattern of rain bringing life up from the ground. Jesus says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike to remind us that God's grace is for everybody. We all get the benefit of this grace. There is a mercy, there is a love, there is a patience of God that is with us and with everyone else, but Jonah can't see it. And sometimes we can't see it either. Now when Jonah first made it to the city of Nineveh, the prophecy, the the thing that Jonah said to the people there was, just 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was what Jonah announced. Repent, or in 40 days, everything will be turned upside down. And last week, we talked about how that 40 days is a a figurative number that means a long time, right? You've got some time to repent, but the people repent right away. And that's not what Jonah wanted. Now, this word for overthrown in Hebrew is nepeket. And a nepeket means to change or to transform. And in in some context, it can be translated, the imagery of the word is um, like making a bed. So things are out of order, and to be overturned in this context means to be put back in order. So it's as if Jonah is saying it like, you all made your bed, now you're stuck with it. And then God shows up in this story like a hotel maid making the bed, tucking in the corners, and putting a chocolate mint on the pillow to say, you're welcome here. Right? That's the overturning that God is up to, seeking love, humility, justice, grace. But Jonah is pouting in anger, sitting in a makeshift shaft, overlooking the city of Nineveh, And as this tree, as the shrub blooms, um, there is a bit of debate. I found this interesting. Biblical botanists don't agree on what kind of plant this was. Now let's just take for a moment to say that biblical botanist is a career. (laughs) Never stop chasing your dreams. (laughs) Right? Like, if there can be biblical botanists, you can be an underwater, like, weaver, Right? Just follow your dreams. Do what you need to. But there is this plant that blooms up. It's the first time Jonah is happy, and Jonah still doesn't get it. And there are times when we still don't get it as well. The compassion of God is something that Jonah continually experienced but failed to understand. Jonah wants wrath. Jonah wants judgment. Jonah wants the people of Nineveh to get what is coming their way And when it doesn't happen, God shows up to try to make Jonah get the point one more time that grace is always wider than judgment, that mercy is always bigger than retribution, that vengeance is God's, and God says, I'm not interested in that. God says to Jonah, you pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise. It grew up in a night and perished in a night, yet for my part, Can't I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? Now, it's probably a little too easy for us to say that God can have compassion on Nineveh and their many animals because we don't know anyone there. Right? Like, of course, they can have compassion. This is a story from 
3,000 years ago. So they can, they can get that. What does it mean for us to say that? Oh, and just think about anything going on in the state legislature, anything going on in national politics. Aren't you glad we're in another campaign year? And aren't you glad that the campaign cycle never seems to end? <laughs> that we are always caught up in this cycle of political posturing that doesn't actually get to an issue, but then has real effects on the lives of people that we know and love while politicians score points? What do we do when we say, oh yeah, that jerk that is cramming through reforms that don't reform anything but actually make it harder for us to educate children. What do we do when we say that person, they get compassion too? What do we do when we say the person that we love the least, they get mercy as well? What do we do with this grace that says all of those people that make us uncomfortable all of the folks that have told me over the years I'm going to hell, they get love also. And I don't get to say they're not a part of this. I don't get to say they are not beloved and blessed by God. And at a certain point, I have to say to myself, I only love God as much as the person I dislike the most. I only love God as much as I have compassion for the person that I would give it the least to. When I was in college at Simpson, uh, my sophomore year, my roommates and I, there were th four of us uh, living together, and then we had one roommate that um, dropped out within the first maybe week of school, which was fantastic because that meant in our apartment I had a bedroom to myself. And it was beautiful because the bedroom was about the size of these like squares over here. And I thought, I have the smallest room in this apartment, and now I finally get it to myself. This is great. I had it for about a month. And then we got a, uh, a knock on the door. And his name was Lloyd McGee. Lloyd McGee was a transfer student that came to Simpson. And when Lloyd was asked by me, because I was trying to get to know my new roommate, what do you want to do with your life? Lloyd said, I want to know how to fix VCRs. <laughs> I was in 2004, which <laughs> makes me feel old because that was, you know, 20 years ago now. But even in 2004, we weren't really using... No, like that, that technology was not, not really the pinnacle or anything to do with a class at Simpson College. So Lloyd was my roommate, and um, one day, Lloyd pulled out his electric razor, and we had bunk beds. I had the top bunk, and my uh, desk was right next to us. And Lloyd got up in the morning, turned to my desk, grabbed his electric razor, and started shaving and I saw the little sprinkles of Lloyd go down into my keyboard. <laughs> then uh, one day our, our shower broke. And so the bathroom was leaking. And the three roommates and I, uh, Nick, myself, and Anders, we were grabbing towels. We were trying to like, put up a barricade. We were doing anything to like, try and stop the flow of water from leaking into the rest of the living room, and Lloyd was um, sitting on a couch playing Grand Theft Auto with a little thing of pucker. <laughs> and we're just looking at him like, come on. <laughs> then, <laughs> Christmas break, we're all getting ready to go home. Um, remember when we thought George Foreman was a health advocate and he made that grill? We had a George Foreman grill, and Lloyd, um, Lloyd didn't want to use the little drip tray that it came with, so um, he set it up to drip into the sink. And he made his meal, and then he left for Christmas break 
which meant our sink had just a congealing mess of Lloyd McGee leftovers hanging out. <laughs> uh huh. I hated living with Lloyd. And the second semester, I made it my mission to make sure that Lloyd hated me. <laughs> um, because the one thing that Lloyd liked about being at Simpson College was that I had the PlayStation that let him play Grand Theft Auto. So I sold it to a friend. <laughs> and I didn't tell Lloyd your favorite video games no more. <laughs> it was just gone one day. And I, uh, I left that weekend. I didn't want to be home because I thought... Lloyd's going to be upset. And I was right. <laughs> Lloyd was so upset, he took a kitchen knife and slashed all of my posters and then poured a 24-pack uh, of Coors over all of my clothing. <laughs> Lloyd was escorted out of the room by campus security. <laughs> and eventually the smell got out of my clothing. <laughs> I sometimes think I only love God as much as I hated living with Lloyd. <laughs> Because as much as it was easy for me at the time to... <laughs> shouldn't lie. There was a moment where he asked me, how do you spell hear like I hear you? And I turned to Lloyd and said, it's H with an ear on it. And I went back to my work. I just, there were so many things about Lloyd that I struggled with, that I hated and I took the one, I took his shrub and I cast it out because I just didn't want to deal with him. I did not want to see him in any shade of kindness or mercy or grace or compassion. But in this story of Jonah, that's what God is continually asking us to do. And the word for pity that comes up in this passage at the end in, in Hebrew is akus. I was hoping somebody would say bless you because it sounds like a chew. But anyway, it is a akus, which is compassion, concern, mercy, pity, empathy. Can you feel God's heart for this person? Even when they get under your skin, even when you have to have boundaries with them, even when you have to put up limits in a relationship to keep you and them safe, can you have mercy for them? So today is Palm Sunday, the start of this holy week where we remember Jesus' last week. And it begins with this triumphal entry into the city where on one side of town, folks are waving their palm branches and they are shouting Hosanna because God is with them. On the other side of town, there would have been a military parade because Pilate was coming in. Because during the Passover, the city of Jerusalem went from about 120,000 people to half a million to a million to sometimes two million people. So the Roman Empire wanted to make sure everybody there knew who was in charge. So on one side of town, Pilate is coming in on a war horse with a military parade and on the other side of town, Jesus is riding on a donkey while peasants are shouting Hosanna with palm branches. Reminding us, or at least reminding me, that at the start of this week, there are two ways that we can go into Monday. We can go in saying that we're riding on that war horse, or we can go in with Jesus from the Mount of Olives, humbly, patiently, and kindly. We can go into this week with aggression, or we can go into this week with mercy. We can go into this week with pity, or we can go into this week seeking ways to dish out our vengeance on all those who have done us wrong. The challenge is that we've all got a lot of Jonah in us, but the hope is God still loved Jonah the whole time. Even when Jonah doesn't get it right, even when Jonah completely gets it wrong, even when Jonah flees and runs away, God is there giving Jonah a second chance, and that chance is always ours. 
Because no matter what you have done, no matter what has been done to you, God is with you and that love will not let you go. And this love is even with many, many animals. (laughs) I love the end of this story because it's this call to remind us that compassion and mercy and grace are with us and with everything else. And we're invited to join in this. So will you join in and find your place in this holy parade that announces God's love and grace are with us, or will we turn our backs on that? And know that even if we turn our backs, God will follow us all the way around, and grace will always be ours. So may you trust in that grace, and may you know that it will never let you go. Amen. As we uh, come to this offering time, uh, Linda will play a couple things about the offering, or one thing about that. We said a few weeks ago, and then I've done a poor job of saying it since, we're raising some funds to uh, be friends with Capital City Pride and help to co-sponsor that. Uh, We had a meeting this week with a group of folks to uh, start planning an ecumenical service that will be during Pride, so more to come on that as well, so you can give to uh, support pride and what we're doing with that and to support the work of the church that we do to be a place that is welcoming to all, nourishing spiritually, and sent forth to serve. So thank you for your gifts that allow us to be the church. And Linda will now play. As we uh, start to wrap things up, there's a few announcements to share. If you are visiting with us, for folks that are online, you can text the word CONNECTION to 515-270-9226. It'll send you back a link to uh, let us get to know you a little better or anything that you're interested in. Uh, In the pews, there's also that orange card. If you are newer to the church and want to get connected, you can fill that out, take it to a person that's going to be at the kiosk, ask following the service for a little bit, and they can tell you more about what you're interested in. Uh, So thanks for joining us. Then we are still collecting bags. Uh, The women of Walnut Hills are doing plastic bags. We're going to start making mats, uh, sleeping mats, 
with them. More about that coming soon. But if you have a bag of bags under the sink that you need to get rid of, bring it here and we will put it to good use. So thanks to everybody that's donated those bags already. And we've got our uh, free store and Monday Thursday collections. Throughout Lent, you all have donated a ton of stuff to the free store and those supplies will be going to folks that are leaving domestic violence situations or are immigrants and refugees. So thank you for uh, helping people start over. You can bring stuff through next week. And then after Easter, we're going to start to coordinate a pickup from the free store. Uh, so you've got about one more week to drop stuff off. And then on Monday, Thursday, on Thursday this week, we are going to make care kits for folks that are experiencing homelessness. So you can bring in bottles of water, protein bars, cereal bars, Band-Aids, toothbrush, toothpaste, those sort of personal care items that might make somebody a little more comfortable. We're going to make those bags on Thursday, so you can bring uh, supplies that night. Then uh, VBS is coming up. It's the week of June 10th, so if you are interested, we're going to have uh, information out to the kids very shortly. With a, I think we've got that ready to go, right, Kathy? A link to sign up, so we'll be sharing that very soon, and we'll be needing some adult volunteers as well, but the week of June 10th, uh, in the evenings, we'll have our Firefly VBS and looking forward to having some fun. And on April 7th, following the service, there will be a discussion group talking about uh, ways that the church can respond to climate crisis issues and things that we might be able to do proactively to reduce our carbon footprint here at Walnut Hills. So if you're interested in that, you can join Jeff Kustra, Paul Swinson, and uh, Irene Damaris after the service on April 7th here in this room. And we'll start that conversation with one another. Then, Monday, Thursday, we're having a meal. We're going to do a potluck in here on Thursday night with a few other churches. So we'll be eating together around tables, sharing communion with one another. And then, uh, Monday, Thursday is like foot washing. We're not doing that. That's why we're making the care packages. Jesus says, love one another. And I thought making care packages sounded a lot nicer than giving each other pedicures. So, um, if you want a pedicure, like, go down the street somewhere. But Thursday night, uh, we'll be here for a meal, and uh, we hope you can join us and the other churches that are going to be participating at Boonville, Maple Grove, West Des Moines, and some other folks. So, enjoy that meal Thursday at 6. Then on Friday, we're going to have a, a combined service at West Des Moines UMC. There's a bunch of church choirs that are coming together to do a cantata, and that service will be at West Des Moines at 7 p.m. So hope you can join us for that. Uh, and Easter is on Sunday next week. So we have the service at 9.30, and then the Easter bunny and an Easter egg hunt following the service. Um, we've got like 3,000 Easter eggs packed. So Please bring children. I don't remember how many Henry packed on Sunday or on Wednesday, but like he was just egg after egg after egg after egg. And we had like a dozen other kids doing it too. So there are a ton of eggs and then even more candy that we don't have in eggs yet. So bring kids because we're going to give them a sugar rush and it's going to be a good time. So hope you can join us on Easter and invite some folks to join us as well. With that, I'd invite you to rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn. It's number 127 in the hymnal or up on the screen. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
So as you go into this week, may you remember that God's grace is with you and also many animals. If you ever need a Bible verse to memorize just so you have one memorized, and also many animals can be yours. Because it is this message of grace and mercy and love and inclusion that is for us and for everyone else. So may we go remembering that this grace is ours and it's always inviting more to be enfolded within it. So may we extend this grace not only to ourselves, but to one another and everyone else. And as we go, let's go singing our sending song.